Thank you, Eli. I'm super happy to be today here and being able to present the advancement or the project that we are working on for almost like a year now in the Liver Hero. Oh, is this is for, okay. Good. So um, I don't know if you are familiar with Delivery Hero. We are like a mother company of a lot of different delivery services around the globe. Maybe you will recognize some of uh, the brands that we have, like for Food Panda, Pedidosia, or Talabat. Uh, we are um, literally everywhere around the world. Uh, one of our tech hubs is located in uh, Berlin, Germany, and uh, we operate in around 50 countries. Or now we acquired also Glovo. Uh, and uh, this number of countries actually uh, rose to around uh, more than 70. Uh, today, we only not deliver only food, but we also try to deliver convenience and groceries with a mission to deliver, uh, deliver everything um, everywhere and uh, locally. So this is how uh, the data in Deliver Hero looks like for us. These are some of the most uh, sold products in different countries. You can see we have uh, products in Chinese, in uh, Spanish, uh, in um, Arabic, uh, and a lot of different languages. It's, it's a really big challenge for us to work with this kind of data. Um, so what is the most common use case that we are very well aware, and especially during the COVID, designing what to order online. And today we have to order, like, or in the last two years, we had to order almost everything from electronics to clothing. And it's really a hideous process when you have to decide what to order. And sometimes um, you are even like demotivated. You cannot find what you really like and you even quit your search. So let's see here the use case of Delivery Hero. So we have two colleagues, let's say Juan and Jenny, and they try to, um, it's a lunch time, so they want to order something uh, for food, and Jenny is vegetarian. So her um, product space, let's say, it's limited because of her dietary type. But when she opens one of our apps, uh, this is Food Panda here, she can order different types of products. Uh, she chooses to order a restaurant, deliver so dishes, and she might see something like this where you have different types of recommendations. We call them swim lists. You scroll um, uh, uh, vertically and horizontally, and you check different recommendations. But in this case, we can see, OK, our recommendations are not very specific for the time, for the lunch, and also the dietary type of Jenny, where we maybe recommend some uh, dishes which are not vegetarian. She can even scroll further. So now we have, uh, we called it organic listing, where you have all the restaurants available for delivery at this time and at your area. And you can see the repeated recommendations, again, not uh, personalized. And this is, this can be very, um, bad customer experience and what we want to try to achieve actually is to to be able to uh, recommend dishes for Jenny that, which are very personalized based on the location and the time and her um, most importantly her uh, taste and food preferences so we would like to, to show her some lunches which are maybe even quick because she's in the office so she needs to eat something fast and then they are ve vegetarian or her favorite places so we would like to achieve uh, such uh, we call it hyper personalization for Jenny. How we, uh, how we can achieve this with such a messy data and data from all around the world? So first we need to understand, we need to understand our products, what we are selling, what types of dishes we are offering to our customers, what types of products we are, uh, um, we are pro uh, showing to them. Then we need to link this to the information of the customer and their preferences of uh, where they're ordered from, what time they're ordered for, what types of dishes they're, uh, they like to order. And to learn um, the information, connect this information and learn the preferences of our customers, in the, uh, so in the end we, can, um, we are able to personalize and uh, give meaningful recommendations to our customer. So one um, a representation of such information that is um, able to capture such preferences is the graph, or uh, as we know, the knowledge graphs where we represent different types of entities and relationship between them. So in our case, maybe the entities would be our customer, the location, the time of the order, the restaurant when they order, but also the product and the specifics of the product. Like, for example, uh, the, is it the spicy? Uh, is it vegan, vegetarian, the dietary type, uh, the size and the quantity, also the, the type of the dish or the category of the dish and maybe the cuisine, uh, world cuisine origin of this dish. 
So you can see here how we will be able to connect our entities and link the information. For example, where, we, where do we order from? What types of food the customer eats? What is the size and the, uh, the taste of this product and so on? So let's see where we are today. So f it's easy for us to um, get this information about the order uh, of the customer, so where and when this customer orders, and also what is the restaurant that order. But as I said, because we, help, uh, we are holding unstructured data where restaurants are able just to type the product of the name, uh, we don't know what our customers are prefer to consume, what are the characteristics and specifics of such dishes. And this information is missing. So um, last, uh, like a year ago, we went on a mission to provide such a level, product level metadata for the products. And you can see here, we have different types of information that we want to capture for our products. We have meal type, which can be like a main dish, side dish, breakfast, beverage, and so on. The food categories, is this a pizza, is this a Coca-Cola, chicken rice, and so on. Cuisine or brand for different types of products from, uh, for dishes would be cuisine, for, uh, for drinks will be maybe the brand. And then for food characteristics, which are quite important, like um, certificates, like is the food halal or not, dietary tax, veg vegan, vegetarian, and so on, quantitative tax, and even looking very, very uh, further in the future, like what are the ingredients of the dish and what are the calories um, of, the, of this dish. But uh, we could not just go in the wild <laughs> and build whatever fancy uh, algorithms that we wanted to do. We ha have to really first check what is most important for our teams, what our stakeholders want to use as a feature on the products first. So we had a, um, like 30 sessions and conversations with more than 13 teams and stakeholders internal in Delivery Hero, and we talked with them, discussed with them for their use cases, for their, their projects, what types of features they need on the products, and we selected 10 um, use cases which were uh, defined and uh, evaluated and uh, you can see the length for example of uh, each field is the impact estimated of the use case so we have from ingredients starting packaging and brand to dish categorization or categories of the dishes but what we first uh, this, um, understood actually that we have to do dish normalization or product normalization which uh, which is basically identifying that uh, this product is a beef burger or this product is a chicken burger. So because um, the data in Delivery Hero is so that every pr uh, even every um, McChicken burger from McDonald's will have a unique product ID. So you're not able to even to identify this is the same uh, product across the same restaurant chain. So they will have completely different product IDs. So we decided to go and tackle the first um, uh, challenge which was normalizing of dishes which would then lead us to very easily extract the other types of um, information for the product like for example dish categorization or meal type classification. And here on this slide you can see a lot of different use cases which we identified across the company that can use our um, use already dish normalization as a feature. And you can see already from discovery, like personalization, uh, search, um, vendor affordability, calculating um, the average price of a given dish and whether we have um, affordable vendors in a given area and so on, to targeted incentives and ads which are also personalized, giving personalized vouchers to customers based on their um, preference for dishes and so on. So this is a really good, um, huge impact across the company. So let's see what was our first stop to hyper-personalization uh, grouping, identical products, or how we define dish normalization grouping and identical products together to decrease product dimensionality. And this is a small sample of our Singaporean data, and you can see already here we have a mixture of English and Chinese and we have a lot of different dishes. And I want to emphasize that it's really important to notice that restaurant dishes or restaurant dish names are not the same as um, recipes dishes. So whatever you find or Google <laughs> on recipes um, databases, uh, you will never be able to match to product names because restaurants want to have unique product names. They want to be creative. They want to, be, to have fantasy, fantasy names. So it's really difficult to work with this kind of data. And if we try to um, manually like try to categorize or look into similarities, we can already find some uh, 
some typos, some mistakes, but we can already find some similar like my Milo drinks or um, some mush mushroom burger maybe probably and so on. And we can try to do unsupervised learning for we, we can try to uh, use embeddings and then maybe you can try to use clustering and uh, get some information, some clusters, which would maybe sometimes capture the, um, this correlation or this relation between the products. But however, there will be a lot of mistakes and there will be a lot of products which we are not to be able to identify what they are, what they represent. What we want to, um, so what we learned by just looking to apply unsupervised methods to to our products was uh, that grouping restaurant dishes, it's, it's not easy. Actually, it's really, really difficult because the data comes from very different sources, platforms and languages. Products have always unique IDs, which are not even same across the chains. We don't have ways to identify two similar and even same products because of these fantasy names that uh, restaurants uh, give to their products. Dishes can be also combinations or combos or meal set combos and have more products in um, capture under one uh, product name. Product data is sometimes available only in the local languages, so sometimes we don't even have a translation to English. Um, dish images are also highly missing, so sometimes even if you look into the product name, it's difficult to understand what is this product without looking into, without having the image. And we, it's very important to um, notice that high diversity of data as food is very closely related to culture and location. So restaurant dishes are not standardized, not structured and incomplete. And it's really a big challenge to solve this issue. So what we wanted to start actually to, uh, to have in the beginning was something like this, where we, have a, we built a taxonomy from scratch. So we, we were trying to build um, dish taxonomy where we will, it will be able to capture different level of uh, granularity of information for the product. So in the, the child notes, you will have the original product name, but then we will be able to identify that we have different types of burger, not only a burger, but different types like beef burger, cheeseburger, chicken burger, veggie burger, and so on. And once you have this information, it's already very easy to extract this higher level category that this is actually a burger. So how can we achieve this for millions of products in tens of languages. So either we can go <laughs> and give this ba data back to the content teams and make them uh, do this manually, which will take uh, months or years of work, and maybe in the end it will not be also accurate or standardized well, or we can try to apply uh, state-of-the-art machine learning, which are able to grasp features and com concepts from uh, smaller data samples with minimal manual feedback that helps models learn, improve, and, and extrapolate knowledge. And you know we choose the second second um, uh, path. So what we decided to do is we are going to take a smaller sample of the data, try to build machine learning model on the smaller sample of data, then predict on a bigger sample of data and evaluate. Go to other teams, ask them to use our data, give us a feedback, and then if we have this positive um, information, positive feedback, then try to expand uh, this kind of solution to all languages or all platforms that we have in Delivery Hero. So let's uh, reflect back to uh, like almost a year back then where we built our first model. So what we tried to do is selected, first we had to select so we still operate on a restaurant vertical. It's interesting in Delivery Hero we also have two more verticals which are DMAR, uh, like um, DMARTs or quick commerce like for example Gorillas what we have here. And also we are able to deliver everything from shops like from books to electronics. But we still, um, the biggest challenge of categorizations was at restaurants level. So uh, we selected Pandora as a platform and Food Panda as brand with three markets in Asia, which is Singapore, Malaysia, and Philippines, which are uh, very well covered with English language. So it was easier to start working with English language. So we took 10,000 rows uh, as a training data or data that should be labeled. Um, these 10,000 rows were not unique product that it is, but it was aggregation of um, already or normalization on product name and menu category. And it was really important to add this menu category information because what ha what can happen is that the product name, it's called triple treat. And then you don't know, is this triple treat um, ice cream, like different tri uh, tri <laughs> flavors or ice cream, or is maybe three types of um, fried chicken or so. So we had to add this menu category information. We, of course, looked into other features like description and so on, but was not really useful. Then uh, these uh, 10,000 um, uh, rows already covered uh, most order 50 
percent and more of the all active vendors, 61 percent of the orders so in um, 30 uh, orders with in the last three months and 58 percent of the most ordered products um, names covered. So um, we gave this uh, data, this uh, 10. 10k rows to a content team um, in Singapore and um, they split the data and to 11 people labeling. The biggest challenge was label discovery because we didn't have the labels. We don't know how to label this data, what are these dishes. So uh, every person worked on their sheet and they did uh, um, label discovery but we had a lot of naming in inconsistencies. We um, like for example, you have uh, one person naming this chicken rice, chicken with rice, chicken and rice. So a lot of uh, different uh, names for the same dish. And then uh, we were fighting about whether we should keep local dish names or uh, English names. So for example, for uh, I think it's uh, Philippines, Sinigang would be a pork soup. Should we keep Sinigang, which is really a specific local dish name, which is recognizable uh, by the people uh, living there, or should we just uh, use the English translation? which would be some type of, of pork soup. And in the end, we had around 1,200 labels. We had to clean up a couple of times. So this was also everything manually checking and bring them to around eight, uh, 820. With this first iteration, we already started building the models. But then we returned back the training data to the content team and we decided, okay, only one person will label the whole data and we are going to keep the local dish names and translation to English or uh, some sort of synonym mapping. And also, uh, so this iteration was because only one person had an overview, so uh, they, uh, they were able to clean up this naming in inconsistencies and so on. So um, we added the local dish names, so this increased our um, classes or our labels and we brought them to 1001. And uh, as we had the uh, we, as we had the dish norm or norm dish names, it was very easy to add the higher level categories, which were will be like burger, soup, or cake, which were 88 at that time. So let's see our problem. So now we have 10,000 rows of labeled data, uh, which are um, labeled using 1,001 category. Uh, or um, uh, classes. We have multi-class classification with 1001 classes, which is imbalanced. So this was also another very big challenge. Uh, we used product name and menu category, our main features. And we, as I said, in the first, with the first way version of uh, label data, we already experimented with a lot of different uh, embeddings, um, text embeddings from word to vec uh, to TFIDF, sentence birth, you can see, and combination of classifiers. So we were checking, okay, what is, um, what is the accuracy, how we can improve uh, the metrics and so on. And uh, we were looking actually in different types of model metrics. So we were looking at F F1 score, which is, was easy to report to our stakeholders, but because we were dealing with imbalanced multi-class classification, we were also checking Cohen's cap and Matthews coefficient. So um, when we compared uh, our let's say winners, and basically they have the completely same metrics, were TFIDF with multi-layer um, uh, perceptron, perceptron and distilled bird from a hugging face. We were looking not only on the model metrics, but also computational complexity and ability for generalization because we were expecting that in the unseen data, we would have a lot of different product names, a lot of different um, uh, data compared to what we get, uh, we got uh, in the training data. Um, what our challenges were data pre-processing. In the beginning, we were, okay, we are going to remove all the stop words. We are going to add, like, I, I think we had like 600 of stop words uh, for dishes like popular, most sold, um, best, and so on. But in the end, this cut our training data set to half, and the models were not able to generalize well, so that we decided not to use any stop words. Um, imbalanced data set, how we handle, uh, we had, I think 30% of our classes were with uh, less than five samples um, of data. So for the model, this was really difficult to learn. So we had to a um, little bit overfeed, uh, try to, um, uh, so we were oversampling the classes in the, um, in the beginning. In the uh, Now we use um, NLP augmentation library to not just simply <laughs> copy the, the training samples. And yes, in the end, we decided to productionalize the steel bird because we were thinking, okay, the steel bird, it takes a little bit more time to train and it's not that fast as a simple uh, 
um, model, but uh, it will help us generalize well, and it will help us to move to this direction of multi-language uh, solution, which we were, know we are going to face very soon. So um, what were the improvements after we uh, productionalized the first model is that we see, okay, we have to use images, and <laughs> this goes very well with the presentation before from Gina AI, with which we looked into um, multi-model uh, models, and we built an early fusion model that combines image and text. And this is something that we work on to productionalize because even our labelers, or when you check the data, you always check the image to see if this, um, if this uh, product information, uh, the text is um, exactly the same product that you think. Because what we have usually in Asia, bubble teas are very, very popular. And then you will have a product name which is double chocolate cheesecake. And first, if you just see this product name, you think, oh, this is some sort of cheesecake. It has a cheesecake, it has all the... But if you open the image, this is a bubble tea. And they are with all the possible flavors you can think of. So you really need this image uh, information to make a better predictions. We also look into active learning to improve and increase training data. So uh, give back predictions to content teams to relabel the information and um, also check, uh, check predictions, but also relabel information, especially for those products where we have low prediction probability or we have classes with very low samples. And uh, we were also experimenting with multitask learning because we have these two levels of information of dish categories and normalized dishes um, and how we can e use this information as a feedback loop in, into our models. Um, another interesting topic for us was productionalization of the model. So it was a new tribe in Delivery Hero. We don't have one unified MLOps platform. So we, at that time, we decided to go with Vertex AI as a solution. We, in the first runs, we have scheduled notebooks that were running in Vertex AI. Today, this is um, Kubeflow. Um, so these are Vertex AI no, uh, scheduled pipelines in Kubeflow, which are running. You can see uh, st still we are uh, using batch processing. So training, it happens only when we add new model or we add new labels or new training data. Uh, so it's not um, frequent, but uh, predictions are weekly. And it's very easy to change this to, for example, daily predictions. We, everything runs in Google Cloud projects. So where we are now, um, today we have, and I'm very proud <laughs> to share with you here, we have four languages and four models running in production that covers 18 countries across four different brands. We have 134 dish categories and growing and adding, and around 2,000 normalized dish names. We have 403 uh, million predicted products um, in our uh, databases, and um, this brings us to around 99.9% .9 uh, dimensionality decrease. When you look into unique product IDs, for example, which were used for recommendations or search return, um, and look into the 1,920 normalized dish names. And also something that we think is really important, we deliver dashboard with all the different metrics, model metrics, taxonomy metrics, data quality metrics to our stakeholders so they can review our data. Um, and I wanted to show quickly the taxonomy. So this is how the information looks like. We are able to do also translation, as I said, to different languages from for example, we built our model from uh, Chinese to English translation. We included images, and then we also have image-only model for other use cases. We tag different features on the uh, norm dish name, like main dish, American, contains meat. And you can see on our roadmap, we already covered a lot of our, our mm, uh, metadata. Uh, it, we continuously iterate with stakeholders to evaluate whether this tag or this um, uh, a feature is important for them before we go and uh, just uh, build a model around it or expand it to different languages. And I'm happy to say that we're many steps closer to our uh, knowledge graph today. Thank you. <laughs>